So we are starting uh, our session. And our next speaker is the Chief Scientific Officer Biotech Biota Tech, a company that is developing and licensing next generation rapid biomining solutions for critical raw materials from low grade ores, tailings, and wastes. Critical raw materials are vital for the carbon neutral uh, future as they are irreplaceable in solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, and energy efficient lighting. Uh, please, with uh, uh, the talk, leaching it softly. Uh, Dr. Pretiers. Uh, thank you, Ilona. So, <laughs> I'll start with the applause. Thanks. Um, I have to, uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here, but I have to start with the apology that most of what we do is still proprietary information, which means that I don't have an acknowledgement slide because the people working on this without the patents are going to talk about this. But never mind, let's uh, move on. So I am, as Ilana said, the Biotodex CSO. And today I'm going to talk about the bioleaching. Which, let's first ask, what is it? Well, it's all in the name, isn't it? In short, it's the separating and collecting metals from solids with the help of microorganisms. Now, in itself, it's actually not a new thing. It has been in use since antiquity for the oral leaching. But of course, the understanding of the microorganism participation in the process that came into existence in 1947, to the extent that it actually warrants a new type of bioleaching, sort of a chapter to be opened, which is called the next gen or next generation bioleaching. And I will talk about this shortly how it actually differs from this legacy biomining. Now, how can they do it? How the microorganisms can actually target the metals? So basically, there are three main ways. Acidolysis, redoxolysis, and complexolysis. Now, the first one up is the acidolysis. And this is lowering the pH of the environment uh, to an extent when it actually sometimes actually goes below one even. Um, metals are, in general, more soluble when there is an acidic environment, as you can see from this picture in here, or from this graph. The PC is the negative logarithm of concentration, so there is a reversed uh, y-axis. The higher it is, the, uh, the higher the concentration, right? And uh, that results in solubilization of metals. And this is done by a group of organisms known as chemoautotrophs. And this acidification of the environment is a consequence of their metabolism. They get their energy from oxidizing inorganic compounds, iron and sulfur, producing sulfuric acid in process. And obviously, they are, really, they, they are also known as acidophiles, or powder, some of the acidophiles, which means that they are really, really good at actually resisting this kind of very acidic environment. So they actually thrive in that, um, in that situation. Now, redoxolysis basically means manipulating the balance of metals. And that can lead to the... Um, separation of metals from the solids, or, for example, through the breakdown of certain complexes. Now, you and I, we get our energy from the high energy electrons, mainly from fats and sugars. Just look at the table outside in the, on the, in the coffee break room. There are fats and sugars in there, right? And we knock them down on the lower energy levels, and we finally donate these to a, let's see if that works. Yes. Okay. We donate this to the oxygen, and this is the reason why we breathe. Now, oxygen for us is the terminal electron acceptor, obviously. But uh, microorganisms have a large variety of different types of electron donors, as well as acceptors, which means that they can actually manipulate a lot of different uh, metals by this. And sometimes those metals don't actually need to be in the direct contact with the terminal complex of, the, of their electron transport chain. And in, they, in that case, they are called exoelectrogens, which, of course, is a very nice feature to have if you do bioleaching. Because then you can actually influence metal that is not in a direct contact with the microorganism. And last but not least, complexolysis. Basically, uh, the compounds formed, and more importantly, also secreted, 
by microorganisms can form soluble complexes with a number of different metals. Um, a lot of these metabolites that I'm talking about are organic acids. So obviously the, um, is Petri on Latve here? No. Oh yeah, right. So oleogenic yeast are definitely a uh, target of our research for the obvious reasons. But also cyanide. Cyanide is um, produced by a number of different microorganisms and this is important for gold violation. Gold is notoriously inert metal, which means that, but it, do, it does react with the cyanide. All the gold leaching is actually done by cyanide, but it's just a question of uh, whether it's a biogenic of origin or not. Now, who's doing it? Since the metabolic rates necessary for the bioleaching are spread out to the, throughout the um, phylogen phylogenetic tree, there's a lot of different clades that actually um, participate their species into the bioleaching. And we're also talking about the algae as well as fungi. So, and the picture actually becomes even more widespread when the consortia are taken into account because sometimes it's insufficient to use just one microorganism. You need a consortium, which means that there's a collection of different species. And if one guy does one thing and the second guy is actually dependent on the first guy's metabolism, so there's a, like a gearbox of these things. Now, as I said in the beginning, the bioleaching by itself is not actually a new thing. It has been in use since antiquity. And on this picture, you see the picture of a Roman time copper mine. I think it was in the Pyrenees. And we can tell from the chemical signature left behind that they did bioleaching there. And also from the uh, manuscript descriptions and all that. So this is a 16th century engraving on the, on the right that shows a miner coming with a bucket full of ore and approaching what looks like a purpose-built pond. And this is widely believed to be the first ever depiction of bioleaching. Okay? Now, this kind of legacy bioleaching is based on chemo autocross, which are naturally found in certain rivers and uh, as well as mine runoffs. Now, so this is a Rio Tinto River in Spain where that looks like exactly like this. So it's very acidic. The pH is below uh, two. And there's a lot of metal sulfates in there. That's why this kind of a characteristic reddish yellowish color. And it is inhabited by a number of different key motocrops that actually um, have been isolated from that particular river to be used later on. And now it has basically proliferated through, uh, throughout the world to be used in the different industrial operations. And that Rio Tinto name down there is just not the name of that river with the fancy font, but this is, a, um, this is a logo of the second largest mining conglomerate in the world that actually traces its origin back to this Rio, Tiba, Rio Tinto River basin and where the metals have been actually mined for the last 5,000 years when the Chalcolithic era after the Neolithic era came to the fore in Spain, uh, they started to mine copper in there immediately. And nowadays, those operations have matured into very significantly large industrial sites. And as an example, we can talk about the Escondida copper mine in Chile. I think it's in the Atacama Desert, yes. And that's the largest copper mine in the world. And they do bioleaching for the metal separation of, from the ore. But the legacy biomining is reliant on the chemoautotrophs, and that's a significant drawback due to their metabolism again, because it requires the presence of uh, sulfur and or iron in the ores, which means that the limited, it's limited to metals found in polymetallic ores along with the iron and sulfur. So we're talking about copper, uh, we're talking about nickel, cobalt, zinc, and uranium as well which means that this kind of approach is all but unusable for industrial wastes. Enter what is known as next-gen bioleaching. So this is basically a result or a, let's say a roof term of the new avenues of bioleaching that have been materialized in the last couple of decades that are not tied down to the, or not directly associated or 
limited to with the chemotrophic uh, microorganisms, which means that the logic of the next-gen bioleaching actually differs. Um, you take the material, or in our case, for example, the, co the customer comes to you with their material, and then you listen to the customer and look, you, you analyze the material, what kind of metals are there, what the customer wants, and then you find suitable microorganism or microorganisms. And then you augment the desired traits. And then you upscale and industrialize. Now, why to do it? It's not like that. Um, I mean, the bioleaching, although it has been around for thousands of years, it has remained throughout this history as a niche role. Bulk of the metals have always been provided, not by bioleaching, by, but by other methods. So why, what's the fuss about the bioleaching? Why just we can't keep on going like we have so far? Well, because the need for metals is rapidly increasing, and we are talking about quantitative as well as qualitative need for metals, big increase in uh, consumption of metals because mostly it's driven by our desire to shift towards the carbon neutral electric energy production. And because of this, the International Energy Agency actually forecasts that the increase in demand of a co couple of metals like lithium, I mean lithium obviously, but also from uh, cobalt and nickel, will increase several tenfolds by 2040. Now, the issue is that the rich ores are becoming depleted or have been depleted which is, of course, very logical. I mean, you first target the ones that were the ores, ore bodies where the metal concentration is the highest, but they are running out. They're running dry, and the new ore bodies are poor compared to the, what, we, uh, what we have been historically mining. And, of course, it's directly linked to these two main methods that have been used to source metals, right? Pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy. Well, the pyrometallurgy is basically a term for a collection of chemical methods, but they have this one unifying term, which is that every gram of the ore needs to be heated up to a really high degree. We're talking about 800, 1,000, 1,200 Celsius. And the hydrometallurgy is um, using solutes to actually um, dissolve the ore and get the metals from, out from there in that way. But obviously, those kind of chemicals are highly corrosive as well as toxic. We're talking about the concentrated mineral acids, lyes, and, for example, cyanide, which is really, really toxic. And because of the biometallurgy, which is the method of choice for a lot of different metals, the mining sector by energy demand ranks a solid second. The manufacturing is the first. Nothing trumps that. But the mining sector is way, be, uh, way above construction and agriculture and things like that. It gobbles up 6 to 10% of the world's energy sector production. And the issue is, obviously, that almost all of it comes from fossil fuels. I believe that given the audience, I don't have to really point out what the CO2 prices and the energy prices are doing which means that all this perfect storm comes, to the fa com comes together in a fact that companies have to pay more for lower yield. And there are really salient socially uh, acceptance issues as, as well. People don't like this kind of uh, heavy industries. I mean, I would be amiss to say that they don't like them anymore, but let's say that in the last couple of decades, the voices against these kind of uh, opening up new operations have, been have become more vocal. Now enter bioleaching, because bioleaching can actually separate metals at low temperatures. We are talking about the temperatures that are optimal for most of the microorganisms, 30 degrees, 37 degrees, which means that they can actually provide an efficient, safe, environmental friendly, and very importantly, socially well accepted solutions to tackle these issues. So what you see here is actually uh, what is known as a heap leaching solution in the open air in Finland, in our neighbor. That's, uh, that's Terrafame. I think it was a Sotko mine, right? And those vats in there are 
gold leaching in Ghana. So it can be reactor-based or heap leaching. And the very important point about the bio leaching is that it can actually target industrial wastes. So in Europe, we have actually billions of tons of um, different types of industrial waste, industrial material, that are basically a um, legacy of historical industrial operations. And they, are, they have a lot of different metals, also those that are classified as critical raw materials. The issue is, of course, that the concentration, for example, rare earth elements in those industrial wastes are pretty low. So using pyrometallurgy or hydrometallurgy is completely economically unfeasible. But the bio leaching, because it actually is targeting these kind of um, issues, it can convert industrial waste to a sources of critical materials, which they are not right now. They are problem waste rather than a source of CRMs. Now let's uh, have a quick look at a few of them and I'm going to show you the, uh, also demonstrate what we have achieved in Biotadec. So bauxite residue, more uh, colloquially known as the uh, red mod. So this is the side stream of aluminium production. It's highly caustic and it has a lot of toxic elements, for example, arsenic, which means that you cannot do anything with that. You have to deposit this. You cannot get rid of it. You cannot enter this into circular economy. But there are also money elements in there, vanadium and especially scandium. Scandium prices, um, low price of scandium is only 10 times less than gold. And in, uh, with the Biotodex technology, you can actually get more than 80% of scandium out and as well as more than 90% of vanadium. Now phosphogypsum. That's the side stream of phosphate mining. Because you know we need phosphate or phosphoric, uh, phosphoric acid production from the, for the fertilizers, right? Otherwise, without the phosphorus that we actually dig up from the ground, you can, you can forget about the contemporary agriculture. But it also has this kind of a, a toxic elements as well as radionuclides that concentrate into the phosphogypsum. Or I wouldn't say the concentrate, the, uh, the mass effect is actually not, doesn't warrant that term, but move into the phosphogypsum. Which means, again, you cannot do anything with that, because it, although it's a gypsum, you have to deposit this in this kind of huge, huge stacks, as you can see over there. And the money elements in that particular waste are rare earth elements, which are, of course, I don't have to point this out to you, how important they are for this carbon neutral energy production. And in the, on, the, on the right, you can actually see the graph how the ratio of the rare earth elements extracted from the fossil gypsum without technology within one hour. And that would be a miss not to talk about the e-waste, which is the afterlife of all your phones and computers. Again, it's a problem waste because it has toxic elements, heavy metals, it has toxic organics, but it also is loaded by money elements, which in this case are precious metals. And the concentration of the ground up PCB, the printed circuit boards, the gold, the palladium, the platinum concentration are more than 100 times that of a economically feasible, mineable ores, right? I mean, the open pit mining for the, 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 the break even point for the open pit gold mining is five PPMs of gold. We get 1,000 ppms of gold in e-waste. I have actually seen, and heard, well, not seen, but heard of the uh, PCB, ground up PCB that are 10,000 ppms of gold. Now, I did some statistics on the, from the web of science on the bio, uh, bio leaching by looking at the academically published papers that actually mention or on the topic of bio leaching. And as you can see, there is a steady increase in this trend line, which means that there are several research groups are working on this, obviously, which is, a, of course, a good thing. And the companies are being formed or are growing at a faster or slower rate. Bactec, Mintec, Semvita factory in the, in the North America, and also Biotatec. 
Now, most importantly, the, uh, the giants of the mining industry, they are focused on the bio, bio leaching as well. And the Anglo-American, BHP, Glencore Vale, you name it, Ria Tinta, they are gobbling up, either gobbling up these smaller companies that actually do bio leaching or are forming their own subsidiaries that uh, focus on bio leaching of their material. So it's a really hot topic right now, which is great. I mean, let's do bio leaching and let's get rich. Well, not so fast. Although the bio leaching sector is really a growing, really on a really rapid pace, it's still tiny compared to the legacy mining. It's $4 billion versus more than $2 trillion. I have to say that this $4 billion, that's, a, in my opinion, it's a heavy underestimate. But it's not easy to get these kind of numbers out because, for, for example, if the Escondida mine does bio leaching, it's all about the company, whether it actually reports the numbers, that how much revenue they can get out of the bio leaching. So I think it's a gross underestimate, but still it's, in the, it's not close to this kind of a trillions of dollars. The mining sector is huge, which means that the mining operations are really, really huge. And because of this, it takes a lot to convince the captains of industry to switch production. Because if you have a cash cow that milks money at every day, if you're going to switch production, you have to close it down. And you got to be absolutely sure that the new way of producing that will actually compensate, and more so, that, what, that you already have ongoing. Well, the scientific groups routinely report 80 to 90% extraction efficiency. But the thing is that they mostly do it in this kind of a one liter, five liter scale. You, you seldom see this kind of a 10 to 20 liter efforts, right? And that's just way too little for this kind of um, mining industry to take you seriously. In Biotadec, we do have a series of 1,000 liter reactors. But this is, and these are the absolute minimum to, de to take uh, to actually do any kind of uh, meaningful OPEX calculations. And you need to do this. Otherwise, they just won't listen to you. And, I, and we can say that with absolute certainty that these reactors are pricey, which means that they are usually beyond the means of most research groups or grant programs, which also automatically means that those findings in the lab, they really don't proliferate out of the lab, okay? And I think I'm going to wrap things up with this couple of, um, to outline a couple of growing pains that actually are linked to this science of bioleaching, which means that this next-gen bioleaching process, for example, by filamentous fungi, are, is, are not equally well understood as with chemotrophs, there is a, a lot of unexplained variability from material to material. And to make matters even worse, there's a lot of uncertainty with secreted metabolites and secretomes. So, for example, if you take the Aspergillus whatever, you take the material, you put them together, you get 60% leaching of that particular metals. Then you characterize the organic acid content that actually comes out of this Aspergillus, and you mimic this with organic acids, you take the same mixture and you don't get the same results. So there has to be more, which means that it warrants this kind of a wide-spanning comprehensive studies on the secreted metabolites as well as secretomes. We don't know all, of it, all, all about this, but unfortunately, these kind of studies are few and far between. They're quite resource rich. You have to be resource rich to do this. And unleashing the power of genetic modifications in bioleaching is, n is not that straightforward. Well, you did see the heap leaching picture, right? Which means that you gotta, sometimes you need to do this in the open air. And the legislation for GMOs in EU goes through national review, national body review, right? So there is no uniform license that you can, you can get that in Germany, you can use that in Portugal, which of course translates into quite hefty costs for a company. And the stock breeding adaptation optimization 
can take a long time without a guaranteed outcome. So with that, I would like to wrap things up and uh, give the floor back to you. So, some quick questions. Um, thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, you come across some scientific groups that are um, studying the impact of bioleaching, but due to the small scale, they are not as effective. But um, have you come across any particular methodology or something that you think has a great potential and should be um, explored more? I would like to correct you that it's, it's not a question that they're not effective. They're really effective, mm -hmm. but you know, in one liter scale. Uh, the, uh, when you report 80 to 90%, which is the, something is not, it's quite familiar in the academic publishing. I mean, they all, they all hold a lot of potential, but now it's the issue of upscaling this. And that's the reason, you know, regular research groups don't have that kind of funding, right? They stop at five little levels, and that's it, the proliferation out of it. There's this, I mean, the valley of death is overused term, but there is this kind of a scientific valley of death in there, because in order to do this kind of a large reactor pilot plant stuff, you need to convince the industry. Right? Industry, you cannot convince without doing this in these pilot plant reactors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Preet, for your nice presentation. <laughs>